Good morning and welcome to St. Peter's. We are so glad you could join us. We invite you to stand as you are able for our opening hymn 421 in the blue hymnal. 421. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing together the glory. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. For God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, Take away 
also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. first reading today is from Samuel. The king ordered Joab and Abishai and Atai, saying, <clears throat> saying, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Shalom. So the army <clears throat> went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom appeared to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of the great oak. His head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then the Cushite came, and the Cushite said, Good tidings for my lord, the king, for the lord vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man, Absalom? The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to do you harm be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 130. We'll read it responsively by whole verse. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to know what is done in this, O Lord, would stand. For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Second reading is from Ephesians. So then, putting away falsehood, 
let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, giving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you are able for our gradual and sequence hymn 533. 533. gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory be to you. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among themselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. 
Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for this life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I, I have a confession to make here. Um, for me, this is one of the most difficult passages. There are quite a number of them. But I find this one very challenging for quite a number of reasons. And whenever it comes up, and I have to preach on it, I take a deep breath and say, please help me, God. So I'll tell you why it's difficult. There are a couple of reasons. The conversation Jesus has with the people he encounters about the being, the bread, which he says is his own flesh, takes me back to a very painful experience I had in my late 20s, which I'll say a little more about. And the other reason is because this passage seems to contain some thorny issues, ones that have been uh, examined and, and asked over and over again and addressed by scholars and theologians of what exactly it means when Jesus says, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father. So I'm going to explain what I mean by these two statements. I have to give you a little bit of background for you to understand why that, for, why reading this, and particularly that reference to I'm the bread of life and, and Jesus' flesh being the body of Christ that we come to gather around every Sunday and eat. So this is what it was, and I'm going way back to my, mid to, to my sort of late 20s. So I was born into an Anglican faith in South Africa, and in my late 20s, my best friend was killed in a car accident. And I sought everywhere to find reasons, to find understanding, to find comfort, to find some peace of mind after her death. It seemed so utterly and completely pointless. But I wasn't finding any answers, even although I went to church every Sunday with my grandmother and I'd more been born and raised, as I say, in the faith. I was living in Cape Town, and on my way back from work, I passed St. George's Cathedral on my way to catch a train back to where I was living. And that's the same church that, uh, or the same cathedral that Bishop Tutu was at for quite a number of years. They had a service every afternoon, week afternoon at 5.30, and I used to attend as often as I could. And there was this one time I went when I was still deeply grieving and very confused and just feeling so unsettled in my soul. And as the uh, service was going to the actual pass, the passing of the peace, and we were um, talking about you know, coming to the table, and this is my body, and this is my blood. Something happened, and, and, and I, just, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. For me, in that moment, it felt repugnant. I felt like, how can I eat anybody's flesh? And I was so struck by this and so shaken by it that all I could do 
was get up and leave, which I did. And as I crossed this road to get to the other side, I had a panic attack. And that was the beginning of a very dark journey because now I didn't even have the faith that I'd been brought up to believe in. And my life at that point had turned to dust and I was finding, I was hitting my set, head on a brick wall. This is after many false turns and many attempts to find some sense in life. And then there was a moment, and this is some years later, where I encountered the living God. It was a moment of being in the unmistakable presence of Jesus. It was totally random. I had no expectation of this. It was the last thing I could ever have imagined. But one thing I knew was that was Jesus was real. And the journey that followed that is why I am here today. Something changed. Something that I can only describe, is what I can describe it as a very slow and tortuous, I have to say, journey to begin to learn to see through the eyes of faith. My perspective on life and understanding of everything was changed. Being changed, allowing ourselves to be changed or transformed is a lifelong work in progress. Learning to see through the eyes of faith, letting go of those things we cling to for so many reasons. We don't like change. We feel threatened by the unknown and we hate feeling vulnerable. It just seems too risky. But now the other reason why this passage resonates so deeply with me is because I will never forget those years when I could no longer relate to the faith I'd been brought up in and eventually completely lost. I'll never forget how disillusioned, hurt, lost, and lonely I felt. And for that reason, I've always been able to identify very closely with those who question their faith, who have no faith, or have lost their faith. I totally get it. And I'm keenly aware that some who visit our churches everywhere are those very people and I wonder what they think about our sharing communion together. Do they have the same reaction to the bread and wine being the body and blood of Christ as I did on that fateful day so many years ago when I knew that my faith had grown cold? What other questions and wonderings do those newcomers have when they come into our, into our churches? Perhaps their reason for being there is not because they lost their faith, but because they don't know how to deal perhaps with the death of a loved one and have come seeking for some answers, something to bring them some comfort. So how do those of us who see through the eyes of faith, how do we behave towards these people? Now I know that people in our Jews today have always been aware of their Christian identity, always been aware of the presence of God in their lives, perhaps because of their backgrounds, their upbringings, and their lifelong co commitment to God. They're people who've been completely fine and comfortable and deeply nourished and, and, uh, and renewed by their faith. Not everyone has to go through the angst as, as I did. There's some of us though that have taken that route for whatever reason. Some have come to worship in Episcopal tradition because of a spouse or a partner and grown to love the liturgy in the process. Some have come from Christian traditions that have found they found too dogmatic or were shame and guilt based with little room for beauty and mystery and their own spiritual expansiveness. There are countless reasons why we come to the table I suspect though that somewhere along the line, every one of us has had an experience of God's presence, an awareness of something we couldn't explain. 
a moment of peace that passed all understanding perhaps, a kind of knowing on a nature walk when we sensed ourselves as being part of something much bigger and realized at some level that we're all connected, all interconnected. Maybe it was something as simple as a stranger giving us a beautiful smile on a day when we are particularly low, or seeing the heartbeat of a little newborn in their temple, or experiencing a reconciliation we had longed for but never thought was possible. I remember a man, he was the head of the philosophy department in Denver at the university there, and he described this sense of presence when he was giving a talk at a Lenten uh, supper I, we were having at the church I attended. And what he told us was that he was driving back from New Mexico to Colorado. He had no faith at that point. And he was going along the main road until, and then he saw a little sign that said, um, Christ in the Desert Monastery, 13 miles. And he says, completely on a whim, he, he braked and he turned and he went down this very rutted road. I've been on it before. You can't even go when it's in a rainy season. It's so muddy. But he went uh, and got, got, uh, got into, uh, finally reached the, uh, the uh, monastery. And there was no one there. He just parked outside the building, uh, the main building. And he was just there for a short time. And then he started his car and he left. But he said that afterwards, as he was driving home, he was completely overcome by the sense that he had met, the way he described it, he met reality. Reality with a capital R. Something more real than he'd ever experienced in his life. And that changed the trajectory of his life forever was just that sense, that inner recognition, which is what the Gospel of John is so much about, is who recognizes Jesus, who senses that he speaks truth. What is it within us that can recognize that? There are blocks, though. There are blocks to why I think we don't always recognize recognize Jesus, recognize the divinity that is all around us. And I think one of the reasons, and, and you may not uh, agree with this, but I think it's pretty, pretty much how I've come to believe this, is that we are so much a product of our Western uh, church, which is a product of the civilization in the Western world. And particularly, during the, the period which we know as the Enlightenment, and this was in the 17th and 18th centuries. And that's when, after a relationship with God that was in many cases, uh, it was more personal, it was more present, perhaps there was some magic associated with it, something that was, there was not that same division as there became when we started looking at everything from a rational point of view. That for something to be real, you had to be see to, to see it. You had to be able to touch it. It had to be something really of the intellect. And for huge sectors of the Christian world, faith was reduced to doctrines and dogmas, to which we learn to assent, say yes to intellectually. And we as Episcopalians know this only too well from the Book of Common Prayer. We say the Nicene Creed every Sunday when we uh, celebrate Eucharist to affirm our faith. But affirming our faith in our traditions, propositions, is so very different from the experiences of the people who, Je who Jesus lived with and worked with. When those who were attracted by his message first heard, heard him, they didn't have the resources, they didn't have canons or creeds, and they had to decide for themselves by either recognizing something in themselves that corresponded to him, something they could see as true or not. And I think that's how we 
recognize teachers today. It's a, it's a process of an inner kind of a discernment of recognizing and knowing. Something in our heart that in that moment says yes or no to an idea, a presence, a person before you. And what's, this is one of the reflections by Richard Raw, a Franciscan scholar and priest, and he said, what set us as Christians on the wrong path was making the object of religious faith ideas or doctrines instead of a person. Our faith is not a faith of dogmas uh, or moral opinions that we deem true, but a faith that ultimate reality, God, Christ, however we understand that one truth, that one reality, the ground of all being, that that is accessible to all of us. Which is why I think we struggle very often to find words to explain our experiences of God, which are for, far more intimate and personal. We have learned our creeds ahead of being made aware that there are many other ways of experiencing God as well. And that God is calling to enter more deeply into God's life through Jesus. All of us have the capacity to have personal, intimate experiences and encounters with the divine. I think that's why Jesus, what Jesus means when he says so often to his disciples and others he meets along the way, open your eyes. See in new ways. Open yourself to me. Be willing to be changed by entrusting yourself to me. And in saying yes to God and risking our own comfort, our own security, and our need to cling to unexamined ways of thinking, to follow the way of Jesus, we come to far more deeply understand what Jesus meant when he said, I am the bread of life. We can't know, we can't know the deep within unless we have recognized Jesus to be who he says he is, the one who is from God and who has seen the Father. I remember many years being so comforted by something that C.S. Lewis wrote uh, when I was starting my own spiritual exploration of Christianity after that experience I'd mentioned earlier. Although I knew I had had an unmistakable encounter with God, that didn't mean that I didn't have to go through a long period of painful self-examination. And that what turned out to be major dismantling of my own ego, my anger, my stubbornness, my arrogance, my pride, all stumbling blocks to my getting to know God more deeply and all very difficult to let go of, and I still wasn't too sure about who this Jesus guy was. And I was ready, because I still had enough anger within me to start reading that book and thinking, ah, I'll be able to luckily just get a, do away with it if it doesn't work for me. And this is what, that's part of the arrogance, but this is what uh, C.S. Lewis says. He spells out so beautifully, um, uh, his objection to people who say they're ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but don't accept his claim to be God. Because he says, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level uh, with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil himself. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human, a human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So whatever is involved in your deepening journey with Christ, the books, the scripture you read, the people you meet, the experiences you have, whether in nature, in your travels, in the church, anywhere, the prayers you pray, the teachers you find, I pray that all of us 
we'll learn to trust our own selves and our own experience more and not discount it as just oh, a coincidence or not really me because you know I'm not worthy or whatever the reasons are for why we block God out from our lives I pray that all of us will be learning will learn to listen to God in new ways to be open to God and the promptings of the Spirit who are the, 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 the vehicle, the way through which Jesus makes himself known in our lives. And we do this often through silence and meditation, but in other ways as well, such as being very intentional about loosening the grip that we have of our desired outcomes and seeking without expectations. I pray that we learn to find God, the incarnate one, in the small things in our daily lives, just as God came to be known through the small everyday things in the lives of those Jesus encountered, in the fish and the wheat and the sheep and the bread and the wine. I pray that, God, that we know that God who called us long before we were even conceived, as described so beautifully in Psalm 139, is everywhere, working in us, through us, in our going out and our coming in. God who knows us, us infinitely better than we know ourselves, who knows our needs before we even ask for them, meets us exactly as we are and where we are, never coercing, never forcing himself on us, just extending to us the invitation. Now, at the beginning of the sermon, I asked the question about what we say or do when we know that a newcomer is in our church and may not have had any real experience of the divine or any kind of encounter with anything that felt real. Perhaps we may feel there's little we can do if it's God who initiates faith in people, God who ultimately brings us to know him. Perhaps we may feel that this is all up to God now. We don't have to really do much at all. But that's not the case. In fact, we are called to do everything we can, not only in our churches, but in our lives, to live out God's love. To make known to people we meet and encounter along the way, the one who is love. And that's what Jesus says is how people will know that we are his disciples, by the way we love each other. Many years ago at a church that I attended for many years uh, in, in Boulder, as a relative newcomer to, to this uh, church in the States, there were so many times I left that church in those early days crying. Because during coffee hour, no one greeted me. I was invisible. Everybody was seemed so excited to see one another. That's when they had their caught up on their week and they were chatted around and no one even looked at me. It was the most desolate feeling and my sense was if these are people of God, do I really want to know them? There was no hospitality, no love extended, no wanting to get to know me. I've missed, visited many churches, Episcopal churches in my life. And there are a few that are open and truly welcoming. We say the church welcomes you, not always. So I do hope this is something we become more and more aware of, is just what we are entrusted with by God in terms of how we love each other and how we show and demonstrate that love in this world that so desperately needs that kind of love. How do we affirm others? How do they know that they matter and they're seen? And I'll just end with this, which is something that a number of you have experienced because we did a pastoral care program together and we reviewed many of the pastoral care skills that exemplify this kind of love. Just ordinary things, finding God in the ordinary, Practices that convey deep compassion and respect of others. And of course, this is not just for people in the pastoral care team. They're for all of us. Every one of us called to love as Jesus loves. To treat our neighbors with dignity and respect. 
to honor their boundaries and to maintain confidentiality so that they can learn to trust us, to listen deeply, to really hear another with the ear of a heart, which is what St. Benedict said, in a non-judgmental, non-controlling, and non-anxious way to support, acknowledge, affirm one another, we do our part and God does God's part. So I will end this by just a reiteration of a phrase that I really have always loved. And that is the sense of we were created in love, by love, and for love. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, return to our bulletin that we might profess our faith, profess our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became true to you. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in the accordance with scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. As Christians, may we all hunger for the bread of life, that we may be transformed into the body of Christ. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all bishops, all the clergy, deacons, and all who minister in the church. We bless and pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Sean, our presiding bishop-elect, Shannon, our bishop, Father Jeremy, and Reverend Lynn, and all lay ministers. We pray for the church, that it will be a faithful witness and the maintaining unity in the bond of peace. We may know what it means to have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. 
in the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Korea. And in the Vermont cycle of prayer, St. Luke's and the Reverend Darcy Mercier and the Reverend Deacon Jim Ballard and their constellation partners, Grace Church. We pray for our community of Bennington and all of its nonprofit organizations, such as PAVE, the Homeless Coalition, Fire Personnel, GBIX, and at this point, you can add any organization you would like. For people in need, that each person's hunger may be satisfied, each person's pain relieved, and each person on our prayer chains and for ourselves. Let us pray for all nations and leaders. May they work for social justice rather than power. May God melt their hearts and transform them by laying down their weapons of war and pick up the armor of God. Help the victims of the war in Israel and Palestine. Remember all those who have lost their lives. Let us pray for our loved ones who have gone before us, that we may follow the examples of their lives and be united with them in the joy of everlasting life. Let us especially remember Sterling and Polly Wilson, Joseph Sr. and Hazel Wilson, and the Hayes, Harry and Violet Ridlin, in whom the memory of the altar flowers are given today. We especially remember Edward Ransom, who passed away a week ago. All generous God, hear these prayers made in faith and hope. Bring us all one day to sit with you at the banquet you have prepared for us who love you. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who reigns with you in the power of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord, hear the prayers of thy people, and what we have asked faithfully grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I ask all of you to please grab a book of common prayer. It is a red book, and please turn to page 815. 815. Let us say together the prayer for the human family. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Jesus straightened up and said to the woman who sinned, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? No one, sir, she said. Jesus, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. The peace of the Lord be always with you. God's peace. You are beloved. God's peace. You are beloved. God's peace, you are beloved. God's peace, you are beloved. God's peace, you are Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God. As you arrived, you were given a token. In addition to what you might normally give, we invite you to place that token in the plate with a prayerful offering of yourself to God. It could be a promise of time, talent, treasure, or resolution. It could even be a prayer of desperation or thanksgiving, a gift of your vulnerability to God. The offertory hymn for this morning is 618, 618.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God living and true, dwelling in light and accessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Join in with them. And giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. the whole world into our care so that in obedience to you our creator we might rule and serve all your creatures when our disobedience took us far from you you did not abandon us to the power of death in your mercy you came to our help so that in seeking you we might find you again and again you called us into covenant with you and through the prophets you taught us to hope for salvation father you love the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior, incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death, and made the whole creation anew. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world, and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and gave it to his and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of it. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming glory, and offering to you from these gifts that you have given us this bread and this cup, we praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we praise you. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be the holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ for the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. And 
grant that we might find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with patriarchs, matriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with St. James, St. Peter, and all the saints who have found favor with you in ancient times. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have us. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may ever more dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith. It is the tradition of this church and this parish that communion is offered in both the bread and the wine. If you would like just the bread, uh, extend one hand forward. If you would like to drink from the chalice, it will be the chalice that uh, Vicky holds. And so if you have just one hand forward, uh, you can go to Vicky and you can drink from that chalice. If you would like me to entinct for you, it will be in a separate chalice. It will be the chalice that Ian holds, uh, put two hands together. So one hand means either just uh, the bread or to bread and drink from the chalice. So two hands is for me to obtain for you. If you're not to receive communion, if, if you choose not to receive communion, we invite you to come forward anyway, as all are invited forward, so that you may cross your hands to receive a blessing. The communion hymns are 335 and 671 as are indicated on the board. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us spiritual food in the sacrament of body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Sustainer, and Mighty Breath fill you with the things that we do not dare have on our own, but carry us through this world into the next and to the great beyond. Amen. Amen. I invite anyone who has a birthday or an anniversary to come forward to the crossing. I was told we did this last week, but I wasn't here. I've been on vacation, so we're going to do it again because I'm a priest and i got a prerogative to do that. So anyone who's got a birthday or an anniversary, come on up. Uh, your backs to the altar because God is always with you. Your fronts to the congregation because they are always for you.
wish to follow along, the prayers are on page 830, if you wish to follow along. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on these your servants as they begin yet another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace, that their relationships may grow in wisdom and grace, and strengthen them in trust and goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We only have a few announcements. Um, first, thank you all for being so amazing. I had two weeks with family, so I could not be more grateful to be back with you. <laughs> um, we will find a new date for the ice cream social. Uh, we figured that a tornado watch and a flood watch were reason enough cancel a scoop of ice cream, so uh, we erred on the side of caution, but we will, we will reschedule that. There is a pastoral care meeting with the very Reverend Lynn Burns. If you can come forward, Lynn. We are so grateful to have her. She traveled all the way up from um, the Burlington area. Yeah. Down. Down from the Burlington area to be with us, so we're really, really grateful. Um, and uh, super hello to Lynn William, if you could stand up, our, our supply organist. We have two Lynns today. So we are just really grateful. Our closing hymn for this morning, I don't have my book on me, which one was it? 488. 488. 488. To love and serve the Lord first to coffee hour and then out into the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.